all high again. <laughs> when we left off, these two children were trying to maneuver some way to meet up and make it look accidental. Sal and Shula are slowly falling in love. It's the sort of thing that uh, the Bible directly confronts us with, says it raw and wide open, as earthy as it can be, and it gives us an opportunity to reflect on our relationships. One of the things that impressed me the most about 30 years of ministry at Cairn University is the nicknames that the students give you. Some of it you don't want to repeat, some of it ends up on Facebook, some of it <laughs> is, is shared in ways that you would rather not, but there is, is one nickname that stuck with me over the years, and it's a nickname that was earned. They call me Saba. A couple of you know what I'm talking about. Saba's Hebrew for Grandpa. One of the things I found out very early in ministry, and and especially in, as a professor in a classroom, is that kid needs a grandpa a whole lot more than they need a teacher. And the grandpa better be a teacher. One of the joys of teaching all these years is to watch kids come in the door and men and women go out the door four years later, five years later, six years later. One of the great joys that comes along with that is that you have a piece of their life. And one of the great tragedies of COVID is that guys like me who love to hug, who love tactile contact, who can't get along without arms around somebody or walking along hand in hand or having that conversation in the hall or confronting people in the parking lot or a student that won't get out of bed and needs a cold cup of water on his bed so he will get up and things of that nature. And, you know, they used to say to me, you know, you don't let us sleep in. You don't let us stop this. Yeah, that's right. I'll go get you. Why? Because you're acting like a fool and you're frittering away a whole bunch of stuff. I had a student once that piled up in two semesters, five Fs. His dad was a Baltimore City cop. When his father came to the university, he said to me, uh, I don't know what my son's marks are. I said, why not? He said, well, he never signed off on the legal ramifications of allowing people to know what he's earned and what he hasn't earned. So I said, well, all he has to do is check a box on my computer screen. And he turned to his son, he said, you will do that, won't you? <laughs> so I booted it up and turned it around, and the dad uh, moved the young man over, and he put a check mark on the screen, and all of a sudden the FERPA laws allow me to show him his grades, the man that was paying for it. So I turned the screen around with his transcript up, and he has five Fs. Five Fs out of 12 classes. And the son starts to say something, his lips trembling, his chin's going like this. He's barely 18 years old. And his dad just went, not a word. He turned to me, he says, they call you Saba, don't they? I said, yeah. He said, Saba, what's your take on this? I said, does this look like $35,000 to you? <laughs> the kid just dissolved on the floor. Did we throw him away? No, we did not. But we asked him not to return for two years. He wanted to come back in one year. No, not ready. Still ready to play, not get serious about things. To his credit, he came back to the university a couple years later graduated with a 3.4 average after those five Fs to start. I had him in a grad class this last semester. He's now the associate pastor at his local church. Amen. He said to me, if you hadn't called me out, you and a bunch of other people, I don't know where I'd be right now. So it's a fearful thing to step up and take responsibility for your own actions. He wasn't ready to do that. And one of the most important things about budding relationships and the seasons of those relationships that they begin to develop is that it can be a fearful thing. And when it comes to this beautiful scene of En Gedi, which becomes their special place, Saul and Shula. You know, you have one of those, right? We talk about our song, our favorite restaurant, 
our place that we visit, etc. Like we own the thing? No, it's just been set aside by memories and dreams and experiences and situations where that becomes our setting for remembering all sorts of things. And when the tough times come and there's nowhere to turn, where do you go to heal the wounds, you know, and lick that cut that won't stop bleeding? You go to your special place. The question is, is your special place a constructive and healing place rather than something that destroys you further? So when you come to a session of relationships that are about to become serious, it's not only a beautiful thing to observe, but it's also a fearful thing. Have you ever had the experience where you felt like you should open up to someone, and as soon as you opened your life to them, they kicked you in the gut? Or they turned around and used it against you? Or they ripped you up one side and the other while they're talking to you just as sweet as pie? See, when you make yourself vulnerable to someone, you're opening up to them. And when you open up to them in that fashion, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. You must do that to develop the relationship, especially this relationship. But it scares you half to death. Is that real? Does that happen in this particular narrative? Oh, yeah. Howard Hendricks used to tell us, don't forget when you're talking to young people and they're buzzing around each other, a couple things need to be before you all the time. Some people are not really in love. They're just in love with the idea of being in love. Real love is quite different. It has responsibility. It has sacrifice. It has welded together all sorts of relationships that cannot be changed and ought to better both of you. You should be stronger together than apart. But how many times has that fallen on its face? How many times has that brutalized you along the way? He said, don't forget something about puppy love. It's really fun to watch. It's almost comical. But it's real to the puppy. Careful how you deal with people. One of the great joys of watching teenagers turn into men and women is that they come back and they say, Saba, would you counsel us? Saba, would you marry us? Saba, would you help us dedicate our children? Saba, would you help us dedicate our grandchildren? Yeah, I'm that old. <laughs> that is a great joy. So 10 months of letters to dear Rachel. Between the two of us, over 200 letters. It's time to go home. My tour in Vietnam is up. I'm short. That's one of those expressions where you don't have much time left. Get out of my way. Get out of my face. I'm going home. I'm going back to the world. Only one problem. Ten months of writing and falling in love with a woman that I have never met. I go halfway around the world to get to know a gal that lives across town. I've never heard her voice live. I've never seen her other than pictures that she sent. All I know is what she's told me about herself and what I hear from other relatives around the way. And they were strangely silent about the whole thing because they were just as fearful as I was, as well as anticipating at the same time, could she be the one? Is this the right relationship? Well, you're about to meet her for the first time, son. And you better have a really good memory about all those letters you wrote, because you're gonna be tested very shortly. <laughs> so we were very egalitarian about the whole thing. We decided we would meet on neutral turf. And we will be adults about the entire thing. If for whatever reason you want to walk away, fine, you can walk away. What a lie that is. <laughs> and vice versa. So this aunt decided that she was going to be the neutral turf. So the night after I got home from Vietnam, <laughs> still pretty much shell-shocked from the whole situation, <laughs> and jet-lagged to be sure, I'm knocking on the door of a woman I've never met and the woman I've been writing for 10 months is in the, in the basement family room waiting for me to arrive. Down the steps I go, and I don't remember much about that. I was pretty well zonked. 
<laughs> one way or the other. The anticipation and the fear and everything that goes with it. I laid eyes on her across the room. We were about 15 feet apart, first time I ever saw her. All I said was, hello, Rachel. She said, hi, Ed. That's the last I remember for about an hour and a half. She hugged me, I hugged her. I kissed her, she kissed me back. It was as like we had been together for 20 years. You see, 10 months of writing where you're sharing your gut level stuff, you know someone better than if you'd spent years with them, face to face, without all the angst, without all the game playing, without all the posturing, without all the, you know the deal. You tell me what he said about me, and I'll tell you what he said about you. All that kind of nonsense going on. All that gamesmanship back and forth. There was none of that in this relationship. Things took off in a hurry. Shula and Saul are arranging a meet. Remember, Shula said, if I could beat you on my turf, I could compete with these beautiful kept women of the court. But I work the fields, I work the vineyards. I'm all sunburned, my hands are calloused. Get you on my turf and I can compete. And he says, well, all you gotta do is figure out where my flocks are. So she figures out where his flocks are. And here we have a meeting, one of those kind of inspirational, on purpose, maybe not, maybe so, it's not working, hello. <laughs> Help me out, brother. There we go. The promises and fears that follow. She's working the vineyards in the king's vineyards. Here comes the king, just happened to be in the area. She's looking for him. He's looking for her. Both of them are trying to tell one another, we're not really trying. It's just happened to be this way. You know, that chance meeting on purpose. That kind of stuff that you arrange and then pretend it's not something that you've been arranging and asking God for and pining with your heart and beginning to fantasize about a relationship that really doesn't exist yet other than in your mind and a few conversations. Listen, here he comes. Behold, he's coming, climbing on the mountains. He's leaping on the hills. He is fantastic. He is so awesome. Look at him. Look at him. My beloved's like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, he's standing behind our wall. He's looking through the windows. He's peeping through the lattice work. Don't tell him. I know he's there. He's not looking. Is he looking? He's not looking. Oh, is he looking? <sighs> you know how that works. You've been there. You've watched it. You've seen it a thousand times. My beloved finds me and says to me, arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come along. Hang with the poetry, gentlemen. Ladies, you already get it. <laughs> Hang with the poetry for a minute and listen to this soliloquy delivered by this brother. Behold, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers have already appeared in the land. The time has arrived for pruning the vines. The voice of the turtle dove has been heard in the land. It's springtime, and love is busting out all over. The fig tree has ripened its figs. The vines are in blossom and have given forth to their fragrance. Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come along. What did he just say? Um, do you want to go for a walk? You, you, you want to go somewhere, huh? Every time I read these lines, I think of the Rocky movie. Yeah. Hey, yo, Adrian, you want to get married or something? <laughs> you know, it's... A... So you got you to gotta put this in normal terms. You have to see this through human eyes. Get past the poetry and all the flowery phrases and see what's going on behind it. Yo, Shula, can we get away just the two of us for a little bit. Oh, my dove in the cleft of the rocks in the secret place, the steep pathway. Let me see your form. Let me hear your voice. Your voice is sweet. Your form is lovely. To be interpreted.
on our 35th anniversary, I sent my wife a card. It's got this little kid with clothes that are baggy hanging on him. He can't be more than five or six years old. He's got a bunch of crushed, <laughs> mangled looking flowers behind his back that it looks like he yanked out of somebody's flower bed. And he's ringing a doorbell with these eyes like the thousand yard stare, you know. <laughs> and all it says inside is, I kind of think I like you a lot. <laughs> That's what's going on here. They're not there yet. Their mind's there, but the concepts have not translated themselves into the circumstances that they wish were there. It's just not built up to that point yet. What's he say? Listen, workmen, everybody around us, do us a favor. Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that are ruining the vineyards. You know, that's their job, to keep the critters out of the goods. While the vineyards are in blossom, my beloved is mine and I am his. See, he pastured his flock here. I know that. That's why I'm working here today. And this chance meeting has been arranged for quite some time. We hoped, we wished, we prayed for, we wanted. Here it is. Yo, Adrian, you want to get married or something? <laughs> There's the first line of this type in the Song of Solomon. She now gets it, he now gets it. They are paired off. It's not complete, this is not a betrothal, they're not engaged, but they will be shortly. Now understand something, betrothal is very different than engagement in our society. Betrothal is a contractual arrangement. You're married, you just have not yet consummated the marriage. That's why Joseph and Mary betrothed to one another required a writ of divorce if he's going to put her away when she shows up pregnant with Jesus. Engagement is quite different. A successful engagement doesn't necessarily end at an altar with people saying, I do. A successful engagement answers the question, should we go forward and get married? That's where they are in the substance of the concept that these slices of time are leading us to a relationship. That relationship is right on the edge. They're paired off now. I know he's mine, and I know I'm his. Sort of. Almost not quite. Approaching completeness. Not there yet. Until the cool of the day when the shadows flee, uh, when the shadows flee away, turn my beloved and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of Bethir. What's going on here? Yeah, I'll go for a walk with you. Yeah, I want to spend some time with you. Yes, I'd like to be alone with you. I want to concentrate on you, not everybody else around. Just like you want to concentrate on me. The relationship is coming together. It's almost, but not yet. She has a dream. A dream in similar content to the one I had all the way home from Da Nang to Yokota, Japan, to Elmendorf in Anchorage, Alaska, to San Bernardino in Norton Air Force Base in California, into LAX, and then a red eye all the way to the East Coast back to Baltimore. I called Rachel at 1130 when I got in that night. We talked for three hours. <laughs> I will meet you tomorrow. What's this all about? The fears. The fears that bubble up. The dream that comes. This is my beloved. He's mine and I'm his. Maybe. Not quite there. What if I should lose him? What if something should intervene? What if people should change the circumstances or the construct that we're living in should militate against this? Something could happen. Anything could happen to derail this. The desire of my heart might be truncated and set aside altogether 
things out of my control, things within my control. I don't know. I want this so bad. I see it as so beautiful. It's all coming together, and I could lose it like that. So she's on her bed, and she's having a dream. I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I couldn't find him. Well, I must arise now and go about the city and the streets and the squares. I have to seek him whom my soul loves. I sought for him, but I could not find him. Do you see the fear? Do you see the possible rejection? Do you see the whole thing falling apart in her heart? It could be, but I hope it doesn't. I don't want this, but it can be. Everything is in flux. The watchmen who made the rounds in the city, they found me and they said, Have you seen the one whom my soul loves? Have you seen my man? Has Saul been by here? Scarcely had I left them when I found him whom my soul loves, and I held on to him and would not let him go. I grabbed that boy, <laughs> the biggest bear hug he ever felt. You got away from me once, but you're not getting away from me again. All in her dream. When Mary recognized Jesus right after the resurrection, what was her reaction? I lost you once. I'll not lose you again. And his response to her was, you need to lose me so you can gain even more. Don't keep holding on to me, Mary. Let this go by God's design. His sovereignty will overrule. All is well. Back off. Slow down. I'm not going to let you go until you're as safe as being in my mama's house in the bedroom where I was conceived. What's the safest place on the planet? You remember John Denver? The troubadour? The singer from the 60s and the 70s? You remember the song that he sang called Grandma's Feather Bed? Didn't get much sleep, but we had a lot of fun on Grandma's Feather Bed. What did they have on that bed? Half a dozen kids, half the barnyard. <laughs> what was that all about? Safest place in the house. That's where the kids want to be, much to the consternation of the adults. I can't tell you what a joy it is and how freaky it also is that at 3 o'clock in the morning when the grandchildren were over, especially when Pippin, the youngest little girl, was staying overnight at our house, and like at 3 o'clock in the morning, there's this cold little hand on your face while you're dead asleep. <laughs> and you look and there's this quivering chin. She has the fuffas, you know. <laughs> you know who that is. Papa, can I sleep with you? <sighs> can you sleep with me? Mom, move over. Here comes Pippin. <laughs> She's scared. She's cold. She's not in her own bed at home. Where's the safest place in the house? Mom, Mom, and Pop Pop's bed in their bedroom. Over she comes. It's like sleeping with a wounded octopus. <laughs> like, you know, hey, John. And she's dead out. And you don't sleep the rest of the night. But the child feels utterly safe now sandwiched between two old people <laughs> who are going to be sleep deprived the next day and not put up with a whole lot. What's she saying? I'm going to hang on to you until I get you safe in my arms forever. But it's not yet. It's not yet. The ladies come on with the chorus and they remind her of something. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the hinds of the field, that you not arouse or awaken my love until she pleases. What did they just say in the midst of this context? Slow down, girl. You're going way too fast. He's not yours to own yet. You are paired off. 
He loves you. You love him. This must progress at its own rate. God will bless in due time. You cannot rush this. You cannot buy this. You cannot force this. If you do it, you destroy it. All your fears will be realized if you push. Don't do it. Don't do it. Back off. Slow down. Wait. But what if such and such happens? Don't worry about that. What if someone else intervenes? Don't worry about that. What if you see someone he loves more than me? That's not your problem. What if there are people that with their jealousy are trying to drive us apart and they don't want to see this happen because they want him for themselves? Slow down. Back off. Relax. Wait. What should I be thinking? There's evildoers out there. There are folks that go out of their way just to mess up other people's lives. Some of it's intentional, some of it's not, but there's plenty of evildoers to go around. And more often than not, that pretty well describes us in different situations. Do not fret because of evildoers. Don't be envious because it looks like they're succeeding for the moment. Wrong will always be requited and judged. Right will always find its proper level and be rewarded. It is never the wrong time to do right. And it's never the right time to do wrong. It may cost you dearly. Yes, you might lose it. Yes, this could all fall apart. Yes, you're almost there, but not quite. But you can't push this. You can't rush this. Redemption didn't take a day. And your turnaround won't either. Be not envious towards evildoers. They'll not succeed in the long run. Have you ever heard people tell young folks when they're asked the question, how will I know Saba when I meet the right person? What's the answer to that? Uh, you'll know. How satisfying is that? <laughs> Not at all. Yeah. But some of us have a list, don't we? <laughs> Check, 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 check. Does that mean that's the right person? No, it means your expectations have been checked off. It's not necessarily the person that the Lord has put in your life to complete you. See, the whole point in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, when this exposition of marriage and putting together people to complete one another is brought to the forefront, pardon me for biting off a little bit of Hebrew here. There's a couple guys that understand me. He's complete in every way when God creates him. What's the problem, though? Physiologically, he's whole. He's missing nothing. He's absolutely complete in every way. And deader than a doornail, like a mackerel on a pier. Until God breathes the breath of life into him. And then he becomes a living soul. He breathes into the neshama, and he becomes a living nephesh. A nephesh, a soul. He's alive, whereas he was dead. Nothing's changed but the breath of God. I had a crash course in the late 60s on who's in charge of life and death. I can't tell you how many times we've tried to save people, pulling them out of wrecks, pulling them out of fire bases, pulling them out of firefights. Barely a mark on them and you can't save them. Other people just mangled beyond description, and they make it. And you begin to think about things when there's finally time in the years that intervene. And it begins to dawn on you, nobody leaves this life no matter how crazy things get. One millisecond before, God has ordained. And they don't stay one millisecond longer either. When it's time to go, you can't keep them. And when it's time not to go, you can't take them. It's an amazing situation. And here's this man, deader than a doornail, and then the next instant, because God breathes his breath of life into him, he's alive in every way that you and I could count as normal. But there's only one problem. He's got no one. So God parades all of creation past this brother, 
And he sees everything in nature has a counterpart but him. Everything has a completer but him. And of course, that's when he named them all those stupid Latin names. So if you want to gripe at somebody for the Latin names of all the critters, get it at them for that. <laughs> Why did God do that? To bring to his attention the fact that everybody's got somebody but you. You need a counterpart. That's wired into us. Now, before you go crazy, those of you that are single, and those of you who enjoy being single, God is perfectly comfortable and able to be your completer without another human being. But that is a gift, not a sentence. So this complete man is made incomplete by removing a portion of his anatomy. He who was complete is now incomplete. I'm glad he didn't take a femur rather than a rib. How's the guy going to walk? You know, <laughs> you can do without a rib, but what's a rib really? What's it all about? It's a tube surrounding DNA. It's a tube filled with marrow. It's the stuff of your life. It's the double helix. It's the DNA of you and me. And he fashions out of that man's DNA a woman, and he brings her back to him to make him complete. He who was complete is made incomplete so that he can be made complete again. What an amazing, amazing manner to go about completing someone. And when the Hebrew comes forward, you don't get it in English. There's this incredible pun. He brings her back to Adam, and Adam says, Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Why? Because she is. And she shall be called Isha, because she was taken out of the Ish. Ish means man. Isha means out of man. She shall be called out of man, because she was taken out of man. What's being brought back to Adam? Himself. The rest of him the completer. Isn't it interesting that every critter on the planet with a completer was made from the dust of the earth except man's completer? Man's completer was made from man. And he to her. Exactly the same relationship. That's why he says, for this reason, for this only reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. And progressive, that's what we're looking at, that progression. Progressively, the two shall become one flesh. Takes time. Takes patience. Takes changing. Takes commitment. Takes understanding. Takes knowledge. Then it takes experience takes a while. Prof, how will I know who I'm supposed to marry? Oh, you'll know. Um, that doesn't help. Because you don't go shopping for a wife or a husband. And they won't commit themselves to a list. The best thing you can do is take an inventory of what you're lacking and go look for the person that fills that hole. I am telling you without any equivocation that my wife and I couldn't be any more different than each other. I was sharing this the other night uh, with one of our friends here. When I got home from Vietnam, I was too little time left in the military. I refused to re-enlist at that point. <laughs> um, and I had too little time for them to put me back into my normal um, AFSC, which is my normal job function back in the States here. So there, it seems there was an epidemic, uh, a meningitis epidemic at Lackland Air Force Base where the basic training was for the Air Force in those days. And they had to ship out a whole bunch of guys early before they finished basic training. Otherwise, they're quarantined on the base until this whole thing was done. So I was at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio finishing out my enlistment. And they didn't know what to do with me. Uh, it just so happened that they shipped some of those guys that hadn't finished basic training 
up to Wright-Patterson so that they could finish basic training at a first duty station. Guess who became their drill instructor? Now, I come home from Vietnam, mad at the world, beat up, upset, not knowing who I was or what I was about, and they give me a whole bunch of guys that need to finish basic. Oh, boy. <laughs> I yelled a lot, <laughs> and they marched around a lot. <laughs> and after a few weeks of that, I got out of the military and went home and got married. 21 months of combat, and my last duty assignment was the drill instructor. Where was my wife coming from? A very sheltered home. She was quite young, had only been working for about a year at that point. Naive, quiet, gentle, protected. So little goody two-shoes marries the drill instructor. Let's just say the first year was difficult for her and me. We loved each other immensely, and she stayed with me. But I put her through an awful lot, because I was dragging a lot of the war with me. It was 13 years before the Lord began to heal my heart from that and turn me around. And that woman hung in there all that time. What was a destructive force in our marriage that we refused to give into became a huge strength in our marriage down the road when both of us began to understand and the Lord broke us. Then we were able to come together as completers. You see, the two shall become one flesh. It takes a while. Some of us are so hard-headed, it takes longer. But break you, he will. And weld you together in that relationship he shall. And her fears are genuine. Anything could happen. It's almost, but not yet. What is one to do? The glue that held us together. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. May I add to this for just a moment? In due time, if you're listening. <laughs> Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. He will do it. Ed didn't do it. Ed got chewed up. 13 years. You'll bring forth your righteousness as the light Judgment as the noonday. So rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in the way. You don't compare yourself to anybody. Your story is your story and yours alone. God is the genuine inventor of one-offs. And every one of us is one of them. He'll prosper in his way because the man who carries out wicked schemes cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil doing. Evil doers will be cut off. But you who wait upon the Lord, ha, you'll inherit the land. Yet a little while, a little while, the wicked man will be no war. And you will look carefully for his place. He won't be there but you will. You who are humble, you will inherit the land, you will delight yourselves in the abundance of his prosperity. Slow down, little girl. It's not time yet. Your fears are well-founded. It could fall apart. But who is it you're trusting? Does stuff keep you up at night? It should. But you also understand that you need to give it to him. Brother, I appreciate you going back to school. I was 27 with a 15-month-old son before I ever went to Bible college. I was 10 years older than everybody in the class. 
when we got to Dallas Seminary after I finished Bible college, and I had two children, had a third one when we were there. I managed to take that four-year program and cram it into five years. <laughs> there were some brothers and sisters that helped from time to time, but most of it was without a sugar daddy. I found out real quick how the Lord normally supplies. They're hanging right there on the end of your arms. Put your hands to the plow and get at it. Ain't nobody going to do it for you. Little girl, slow down. Your fantasy world is going way ahead of the reality of this situation. It takes time to develop a relationship that's going to last and be solid. You came to the Lord Jesus. Did you get it all of a sudden? You were prepared. You were wooed. You were moved along. All sorts of things were broken in your life until you came to that one point where you were that low low-hanging fruit, where all of a sudden the lights came on and the Spirit opened your eyes and your heart and your ears and gave you the ability to say yes. And of course, from that moment on, everything was just tulips and rose beds and smooth going. Come to Jesus and everything will be wonderful. Come to Jesus and all the bad things in life will go away. What's my experience? Come to Jesus and all hell will break loose. Come to Jesus and you can plan on an exam every other day. Every time he opens your eyes to something, every time he shows you something new, every time he seeks to build something else in your life, something's got to go. Something's got to be torn down. Something's got to be wrecked. There's a guy on the radio the other day said his apartment was so small that if anybody gave him anything, he'd have to get rid of something. <laughs> That's life, isn't it? a grain of sand, a grain of sand, a grain of sand, a grain of sand. Before you know it, you've got a mountain. It works that way in reverse too, doesn't it? People roll over 15 years into a marriage, decide they don't love each other anymore. They end up in my office. I don't love her. She doesn't love me. How long have you been married? 15, 20 years. Kids? Mm -hmm. I don't love her. What do you mean you don't love her? You just, you just decided that today? How'd this come about? Grain of sand at a time. That didn't start last night. That started years ago. And you were doing this. Doing this. <laughs> Can't stand her. I hate her. She hates me. Would you consider the enemy? Yeah, she's an enemy. Fine, start there. Love your enemy. <laughs> so you don't have to like somebody to choose to love them. It's amazing how like follows choosing to love. Two people come together, the first thing they need to know about each other is to honor the fact that they are two human beings made in the image of God. The question then is, do we walk this earth together and become one? Let's go back to that first and second chapter of Genesis for just a minute. God breathes nashama, the breath of life, into Adam, Adam. What's Adam mean? It's, it's, it's from a bigger word, Adama. What's Adama? Dirt. What's he made from? Dirt. What's his real name? Dirt guy. Third guy's made incomplete. She's brought back to him to complete him. Because of the nefesh. Because of his soul. Because of being ensouled directly by God. His counterpart is of his DNA and his functionality rather than the dust of the earth. There's three different ways to describe, many more, but three primary ways to describe friendship when it comes to the Hebrew people. There's a Yadid. A Yadid is an acquaintance. Somebody you know, somebody you say hi to, somebody you say, how you doing, and you don't expect a real answer because you'd be there all day. 
You want to stop people from asking how you're doing? Tell them. <laughs> they won't ask you anymore. <laughs> the next level is Haver. There used to be bumper stickers in the Jewish neighborhood where I spent a great deal of time and where my wife grew up. When, uh, when one of the prime ministers of Israel was assassinated, there were bumper stickers that showed up all over the cars in the neighborhood. Shalom Hafer. Goodbye, friend. Yitzhak Rabin, when he was killed. See, a chaver is a person that you don't keep score with. You know, you come to my house, I come to your house. You eat at my table, I eat at your table. Whose turn is it to take somebody out to the restaurant and eat together? Well, I don't know. Doesn't matter. We're friends. We share. We're brothers. We're sisters on that level. One more level. Yadid nefesh. What's that? Well, a yadid is an acquaintance, right? The nefesh is my soul. So what am I looking for? A soulmate. A yadid nefesh. A completer. Rarely do people in this life have one of those. A real soulmate. If that soulmate is your completer, your spouse, Oh my, that's right out of Genesis 2. You see, the marriage that portrays that one heart, one soul, one completing relationship is precisely the example that Jesus uses and that God in his wisdom used in writing scripture to explain the relationship he wants with you and me. Where are you in the progression of that relationship. You're still just getting to know them? Have it moved to, I love him, but something could go wrong. Can I trust this man? Do I dare open myself up and be vulnerable to him? <laughs> That's always a foolish notion, because who reads hearts? Who knows the intention of the heart long before we're even aware of it? That must move to, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. And there's a progression of this all the way through the book. That was the first one. I'm his and he is mine. Almost, sort of, really not sealed, could fall apart. What about this Jesus person? Can I really trust him? I want it, but I don't want it. I want to give myself to him, but I don't dare give myself to him. Every time I've given myself to somebody in the past, they've kicked me in the gut. They've used it against me. They've worked me over in one way or another, or they failed me, walked away, and left me in the lurch. Should I do this again? Scripture and church history is filled with people who have made that decision. One of them was Hudson Taylor, founder of the China Inland Mission. Early in his ministry, before things really began to take off, he was walking the beach in Brighton, England, and he realized that Jesus needed to be Lord of every area of his life. He needed a Yadid Nefesh, the one who truly loved him, the one who would be his husband forever, the one who would cherish him and love him as the wife that this man wished to be. He said it dawned on him on that walk that morning that he was more than happy to have this man purchase his salvation and take him to heaven to escape hell. But he wasn't about to live with him as Lord of his life. It wasn't until that surrender took place that Hudson Taylor became the Hudson Taylor you're aware of in church history the founder of China Inland Mission, supporting a thousand missionaries in inland China at the turn of the centuries between the 19th and 20th centuries and never asking for a dime to fund it.
stay tuned, folks. This relationship is not over. But understand what's at stake here. This isn't just about Ed and Rachel, although we identify very thoroughly with this. It's not even about Saul and Shula. It's about the coming king that wants a wife who will simply give herself to him because he's worth it and he'll love her forever. Is the risk worth it? Can you trust him in the here and now in this betrothal period prior to the wedding? This is the time where we are to be demonstrating we have taken ourselves apart from all other lovers and give ourselves wholly to him. Father, bless this time together. Take these few words as we move deeper into this book. Help us to understand, to see, to grasp, to become more like your son. Move in our hearts and minds. Set aside those things that are barriers, walls, our defense mechanisms, all the things that we find security in that are false security. There's only one savior of our soul and there's only one enlivener of our being. It is your son, our savior. By your decree and by his faithfulness, we can and shall continue to become closer, more complete, more fully given to the one who is the completer of our soul. It's in his name we pray. Amen.